take advantage of your spontaneous quieting down to so be our next panel. Uh, my name is Martin Flaherty. I am uh, the uh, or one of two uh, Leitner professors of international law uh, here at Fordham Law School. I'm also the uh, or one of two uh, founding co-directors of the Leitner Center for International Law and Justice. Um, and this panel is going to look at uh, U.S. citizenship and, as you heard the quote of Hannah Arendt, the right to have rights and whether the right to have rights is connected to citizenship. And um, I guess since I have two small school age children, I want to start out uh, uh, saying a little bit about this topic with some show and tell. And here's the show and tell. Here's passport number one. Mine. I can see the proud American eagle. But passport number two also mine, with the Irish heart. And though after I've had a few Guinnesses, you might detect traces of an Irish accent, in fact, neither myself nor my father was born in um, Ireland, but in the United States. And indeed, my daughters, who uh, uh, the younger one has never been to Ireland, uh, is also an Irish citizen, by dint of the citizenship rules that Ireland has. And so, my daughters, who uh, one has never been to Ireland and the other uh, has been um, once when she was three years old, they have all the rights protected by the Irish Constitution, which actually has a more fulsome bill of rights than the US Constitution. Not only that, they have the full panoply of uh, rights under the European Union and the Council of Europe, which includes the European Convention of Human Rights. And they have all of those rights in, in full degree, uh, where some who have not been in, uh, 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 born in those countries, but yet who have been living in countries within the Council of Europe or in Ireland itself, have comparatively far fewer rights, all based on citizenship. That seems to be an anomaly. Uh, and it's something that I want to offer just uh, as a uh, preface to this panel, given that one of the things that we will be talking about is, will be what is and what should be, uh, especially in the American constitutional conception, the relationship between fundamental rights, the right to have rights, and citizenship. Given the um, uh, idiosyncrasies of citizenship itself. Now, um, my skepticism about that uh, suggests that one vision of the Constitution is, uh, relates more to a personhood conception of constitutional law that you heard from uh, David Cole. But as a matter not so much of international human rights, but of uh, US constitutional rights. And there, the idea would, is uh, manifested through such doctrines as the extraterritor extraterritoriality of the Constitution, in particular its rights protections, and more fundamentally, a conception of the Constitution that it is a creation of we the people that it creates government but limits it even as it creates it, and that those limitations apply wherever the government asserts its authority regardless of the citizenship of those on whom it is asserting that as a party or where it is asserting that as a party. That's one conception. Um, today's panel will emphasize two other conceptions, and, and I'll say less about those, but one conception is that uh, territory is going to matter uh, in, in significant part with regard to the exercise of fundamental rights. And then finally, the name of the panel itself, the relationship of citizenship itself. And so you'll hear a lot about the second two themes, but I wanted to put the first theme on the table as well. Um, it's only to uh, plant some uh, thoughts and questions. So to explore all of this, we have, um, uh, as we had in panel number one, uh, uh, what I think is a great panel. Um, and uh, before I introduce them, I do want to thank the folks who helped put this panel and this um, uh, conference together. And that's first and foremost Karen Greenberg and her team, uh, Susan and Stephen, as well as my colleagues, uh, Andrew Kent, uh, uh, Tom Lee, and Joe Vento. So, uh, to explore the issues I put on the table, um, 
Uh, let me introduce everyone briefly up front in the order that they'll be speaking and then turn things over to them uh, for about 15 minutes of uh, presentation and then we'll turn to questions and answers from you, the audience. So first up will be my colleague Andrew Kent, who is a professor here at Fordham Law School. Uh, he teaches and writes about constitutional law, foreign relations law, national security law, and uh, public international law. He uh, has a law degree from Yale and was a, a Flamenco fellow at Harvard Law School. Um, his writings uh, frequently focus on the question of the scope of the Constitution, when and for whom are constitutional protections available, particularly from a historical point of view, uh, and unlike a lot of other law professors, from a very rigorous historical point of view. Uh, second up will be Jennifer Elsie, who is a legislative attorney uh, at the Congressional Research Service. American Law Division. She has an MA from Boston University in International uh, Affairs, or International Relations, and a JD from Washington College of Law uh, at American University, um, and an MS in National Security Strategy. Um, she was former captain in the United States Army Military Intelligence Corps, and has a background in an array of national security issues. Uh, third, we will hear from Naomi Rao, who is an associate professor of law at George Mason University. Uh, there, she teaches constitutional law and legislation. Her research focuses on structural constitutional law and international law. Uh, her experience in all three branches of the, or she has experience in all three branches of the government, uh, including associate counsel and special assistant to President George W. Bush. Uh, counsel for nominations to the United States uh, Senate Committee on the Judiciary and was a law clerk to Justice Clarence Thomas. So, without anything further from me, let me turn things over to my colleague Andrew. Thank you. For the, uh, for the symposium issue of the law review, I've so provisionally titled the paper on <coughs> Citizenship, War, Geography, uh, National Security, and the Changing Domain of the Constitution. Uh, and I just want to explore a little bit of some of the things I'm thinking about and going to be writing about. So by the domain of the Constitution, I'm borrowing a phrase from uh, Professor Gerald Newman uh, to refer to the range of places, uh, persons, and contexts over which the Constitution provides protection and, and over which it does not. Uh, the Constitution has always had a domain. Uh, its protections have never been universal. Uh, and although this conference is about citizenship primarily, uh, one of the points I want to make is that citizenship has played a relatively minor role uh, throughout American history in demarcating the Constitution's domain. That is to say, determining who can invoke its civil liberty protection. So when, you know, as we've heard, when, uh, you know, quoting uh, Hannah Arendt, when Chief Justice Earl Warren you know, describes citizenship as man's basic right because it's the right to have rights, he's actually not precisely correct about, about our Constitution. Uh, historically, the primary axes along which uh, the Constitution's domain have been you know, limited or demarcated are territorial location. And geography uh, and enemy status during wartime, uh, foreign geography. So citizenship matters, but as we talk about a little bit, uh, less and often quite a bit less than those other two factors in determining the demand of the Constitution. I'm going to generalize a little bit about the domain rules of the book of American history, not because there isn't a lot of nuance, not because nuance doesn't matter, but because I want to try to make some points about some big picture changes over time in the Constitution's domain. Uh, and just sort of a big caveat at the beginning. Um, I'm not going to talk about it, not because it's unimportant, but because I'm just speaking about something else. A lot of the domain limitations uh, internally within the United States refer to people like uh, women, slaves, free slaves, African Americans, you know, Indians, the incarcerated mentally ill. I mean, there's a whole you know, extremely important category of people who've been uh, you know, quite limited in their ability to claim civil liberty protections in the Constitution. Uh, but I'm going to try to talk about something somewhat different, which is to say the national security and foreign relations context. Um, and it's focusing on citizenship, war, geography uh, in, in that area. Um, so, starting at sort of you know, big picture kind of generalizations about uh, historical rules governing the domain of the Constitution. Uh, citizens and non-citizens non have both been, uh, been protected by the Constitution's civil liberty provisions when they're in the United States. Uh, but war and geography uh, have provided limits to that. So if we look at wartime, both citizens and non-citizens present in the United States uh, remain protected by the Constitution during war in sort of behind the scenes or, or home front context. But uh, persons resident in, in every nation, 
uh, all persons uh, who are enemy fighters, uh, and all persons living in a zone of actual combat during wartime uh, have not generally, over the course of our history, been protected by the Constitution. And protections come from other sources of the law, like international law, the common law, perhaps, but not from the Constitution. And this is irrespective of citizenship. Uh, geography. Um, as I've already mentioned, geography during war matters, being resident in an enemy nation or being present at the site of actual uh, warfare has, has meant that the Constitution's domain is not extended there. But geography has also mattered a lot, uh, even in peacetime. Constitutional protections against extraterritorial action by the U.S. government uh, have never, prior to the 21st century, been understood to be available to non-citizens, non-citizens outside the United States, and have not been protected by the Constitution. Um, questions about citizens outside the Constitution uh, are complex. Uh, at, some, at some points of our history, there have been suggestions that citizens are protected extraterritorially. At other points, um, it, it seems that citizens have not been. But primarily, when we're talking about extraterritorial national security, military intelligence activities, you know, the primary people that these are uh, these activities are, are, are running up against are non-citizens. So, you know, for a lot of purposes, the question of whether U.S. citizens have extraterritorial, extraterritorial constitutional rights has not been particularly important, becoming more so in the modern era, which I'll, I'll talk about briefly. Uh, so, those are sort of the very broad outlines of historical rules about how uh, civil liberties and the Constitution are allocated. Uh, and I wanted to just say a couple things uh, about it. I want to talk a little bit about sort of the normative justifications for, for these rules. You know, there's uh, plenty of bad reasons uh, that have been canvassed for why these uh, why protections have been limited by war and geography. I want to just talk for a moment about whether there are some normatively attractive uh, you know, reasonable justifications for why we might limit the constitutional domain in those ways. Um, second thing I want to do is just make a, a quick point, which I'll just sort of get out of the way mostly now. Which is, a, you know, especially law professors and lawyers generally were obsessed with the Constitution. Uh, there's so much writing and thinking and litigation is about the Constitution and its protections. But uh, there are a lot of other ways. In fact, there's sort of two other very important ways that people are protected against U.S. government overreaching. One is non constitutional law. And historically, international law and common law have been extraordinarily important, sometimes even more important than the Constitution, in limiting uh, <laughs> people uh, in war and foreign affairs contexts. Uh, and shouldn't be said that. And the second is that institutional design is, is extraordinarily important. The way uh, the United States institutions have been set up uh, and the way and the sort of substantive rules that have, been, uh, that, that have been put in place to govern which institutions can do what things, um, you know, non constitutional law, but extraordinarily important in, in, um, in providing protections to people against the United States government. Um, and the third point I want to make is about convergence uh, of several types. Um, David Cole and other folks are right that you know, the, the war in Paris saw some uh, pretty stark distinctions being made between citizens and non-citizens and things like military commissions and whether you would be sent to Montana or not. But I think the bigger picture trend is, is convergence, that so these older understandings uh, are starting to break down. I think the importance of citizenship and protecting civil liberties is decreasing even more than the Peter Spear and other, other people have written about. It. Um, and that you know, has both positive and negative aspects, but I think that is the larger trend. Um, to some extent, non-citizen rights are being raised up a bit, closer to those of citizens. To some extent, U.S. citizens' rights in the last decades or so have been, have been lowered to some extent. Uh, but whether it's coming you know, positively or negatively up or down, I think convergence is the, is the bigger trend, rather than, than continuing to draw distinction between uh, people on the basis of citizenship. And the other big sort of convergence trend is that sort of categorical, you know, formal distinctions you know, inside or outside our territory between war and non-war, those are under sustained challenge and are really breaking down. Um, and so you know, wartime is becoming, you know, looking more like peacetime in terms of constitutional protections, and outside the U.S. is starting to look a lot more like inside the United States in terms of constitutional protections. Um, all right, so quickly, uh, normal justifications uh, on, on domain limits. Uh, Linda. Bosniak has it in her writing you know, called the, the, the rule that you know, sort of the United States territory is sort of the zone of constitutional liberty while outside the territory is not the heart of the outside, soft of the inside approach. Uh, and I want to ask, um, you know, are there any, any good reasons for this? Um, as I said, there are some, you know, some disreputable or, or unpleasant reasons for this, but are, are there some good ones? And I think, uh, I think there are. Um, so first, on the specific question, why would we want to treat non-citizens inside the United States as well as citizens for civil liberties purposes? Um, you know, the idea of equal treatment has really ancient religious and moral roots. Um, I'm probably going to be one of the people in the court of Leviticus today. Um, says, you shall have one manner of law as well as for the stranger as for your, one of your own country. 
uh, for our new Lord your God in Kansas. Uh, so the idea of, of equality, you know, again, is, is really ancient uh, and moral and religious roots. But I think there's some very important instrumental reasons as well why you might treat both citizens and non-citizens uh, essentially you know, very similarly, if not the same, within the United States. Uh, this promotes peace. Uh, mistreating foreign nationals um, prior to the 20th, 20th century was a justifiable cause of war. Um, and so uh, you know, granting them equal justice was, was a way to preserve peace. This promotes commerce, other you know, beneficial forms of trade and exchange. This promotes immigration, uh, which has always in the United States been thought to be a great source of strength um, economically and in other ways. Uh, the, the equal treatment norm uh, domestically helps uh, maintain law and order. There's uh, people who feel secure uh, within the protections of the law are also more likely to be able to obey the law. Um, it helps protect the liberty of the United States citizens to treat non-citizens equally you. Um, you know, the point here was to sort of domestically build a government that was not tyrannical, that was limited to respective rights, that operated through ordinary legal processes. Uh, and if we empower the institutions of our government to treat non-citizens in the United States harshly, uh, then that, you know, sort of the entire point of our constitutional system, I think, would be greatly undermined. Uh, so, you know, in other words, a way to protect you know, the security of, of citizens and the liberty of citizens here is by structuring our government to protect non-citizens' rights as well, uh, and by restraining our government through the Constitution to protect the rights of non-citizens within the United States. Um, and this, so sort of going to the point of institutional design, um, our military and intelligence and sort of our general national security structures are deeply based on this sort of foreign domestic divide. With the entire point being um, to have a soft inside uh, and a hard outside. Um, I mean, we can see this in so many different ways by constitution, statute, by sort of long-standing norms, but you know, just to mention sort of a couple of prominent ones, um, you know, our, our intelligence uh, activities are in you know, this very strict foreign domestic divide where uh, you know, the law enforcement organization, the Department of Justice, operating under constitutional constraints that has the authority for the intelligence activities within the United States, is a much less restrained, much less you know, law-abiding institution, CIA, that's turned towards the outside world. Um, our constitution, our statutes, our history have incredible limits, very, very strict limits on the extent which the military can be used within the United States. Um, uh, we want to have a strong military to promote, uh, you know, to protect the United States, but don't want it to be turned inward. Uh, and the, you know, the, the Constitution law practice that has pervasively done that throughout our history. Um, there's all kinds of other, kinds of other things. Uh, you know, corporate actions are essentially banned from the United States. And at the very least, you know, corporate action, you know, very coercive type of U.S. government activity is allowed to uh, be intended to influence the United States uh, political processes or media. Um, by executive order, the intelligence community has to they use quote unquote least intrusive means uh, to collect anything within the United States that they don't abroad. You know, FISA, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, which has gotten a lot of attention recently, uh, is premised on the foreign domestic divide. It's a very complex statute, but essentially there are very heightened protections, judicial protections uh, for, um, uh, you know, for domestic communications and much less restraint, um, and very little judicial restraint of any kind. They're going after foreign uh, communications. So, you know, with the military and, and, and the intelligence agencies, uh, you know, sort of the, the hard edge, or the you know, sharp point of spirit pointing outwards, and very specifically, our institutions are designed to protect um, uh, you know, inside the United States. But to do that, we have to, within the United States, protect you know, both citizens and non-citizens. It's you know, very difficult ex ante to know whether you know, if you're going to stop and frisk somebody or mistreat somebody, you have to know whether that's a citizen or a non-citizen. So you know, rules that, uh, that don't allow you to do that to, to anybody, irrespective of their citizenship, are sort of the best way uh, to preserve this. You know, things like military force and other very coercive form of government activity, they tend to spill over beyond their intended targets. Uh, so we would not want to authorize them to be used in any you know, real way within the United States because that could you know, affect everything. Um, I imagine most people feel pretty comfortable with the, with the idea that both our constitution and our institutions are supposed to protect uh, everybody in the United States, irrespective of citizenship. The more controversial stuff, I think, gets when we're talking about uh, going outside of war, where again, uh, our historical practice of constitutional rights is not going to protect non-citizens. Um, and certainly our the institutional frameworks that I, I uh, mentioned are set up precisely to allow you know, sort of coercion and hard-edged government activity uh, abroad, largely against uh, non-citizens. So what do we think about this? Are there any uh, you know, potentially you know, non-evil uh, you know, non justifications for, uh, for having things set up this way? Um, I, think there, I think there are. Um, where we weigh this all in the balance, um, you know, I'll leave for others to decide. But I think there are some 
some reasonable basis where we might uh, draw this foreign domestic line in terms of constitutional protection uh, and, and governmental protection in general. So internally, uh, you know, our government has both the capacity and the duty to create uh, sort of an ordered society of, of liberty and that's pervasive you know, contact with and control over the people here. Uh, I can legislate in far-reaching ways to structure you know, our government, our economy, our society. It has an incredible number of levers of control over people within the United States, you know, criminal law, tax law, and civil regulation, the monopoly on the use of uh, force, it's, it's, you know, the, the monopoly on the, on the possession of the military, etc. Um, so at home, you know, the government is essentially you know, all-powerful, um, but has a duty to, to the maximum extent possible to sort of promote human flourishing. So in these circumstances, um, I want the government to be you know, quite limited through the constitution and through institutional design and the powers that it can exercise over it, because it has so much power. Uh, but externally, the government has a lot less power and it acts for very different purposes. It has much less practical ability to control and coerce people. Uh, when it does exercise power extraterritorially, it's usually only episodic, usually either only with the consent of the territorial state um, or hostily. Uh, and most of those things either needing to get consent or acting only hostily with other people opposing you, with real practical limits on the kind of force that the United States can, um, uh, can exercise abroad. Uh, and again, you know, the purposes of government action outside the United States are very different as well. Uh, the government's not externally trying to create uh, you know, sort of civic order for the most part. True, we engage in nation building sometimes, but primarily, we talk about use of military force intelligence, et cetera. That's not, um, that's not the purpose. Um, and just looking at the individual rights provisions that we have, um, they're just simply not designed for extraterritorial, military, or force of intelligence actions. They're designed for the paradigm case of peacetime within the United States. I mean, a bunch of the parts of the Bill of Rights just make, I think, absolutely no sense to think about applying to extraterritorial, military, or force of intelligence activity. You know, the Second Amendment, it's, 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 it's Third Amendment, of course. Uh, the Fourth Amendment, I mean, seems crazy to think that the, the Fourth Amendment rules would be a limit on what, you know, say, our military could do um, uh, when engaging in armed conflict outside the United States. And the First Amendment, it's really hard for me to imagine how you know, the press and assembly and, and, and speech and religion protections of the First Amendment could possibly be designed or thought to fit, uh, you know, to be a good fit for regulating extraterritorial actions of, of the military or intelligence agencies. Um, and a lot, of the, a lot of the most important parts of the Bill of Rights, you know, the uh, due process clause, the Sixth Amendment, um, you know, the habeas corpus suspension clause, and Article One. a lot of these sort of presuppose uh, a, domestic, uh, a domestic order where civil courts are functioning uh, and where government coercion happens you know, in, a, in a regularized and legal way. And taking you know, the incredibly extensive and important you know, rights that have been developed from that paradigm context and trying to sort of shoehorn them into the extraordinarily different context of, of, of war and intelligence gathering uh, or other kinds of course of activity outside the United States, uh, I think it, it's, it's a terrible fit uh, for the most part. Uh, uh, constitutionalizing things in that way uh, runs a real risk of baking in rules that might not work very well. Um, I'm a big fan of very extensive protections under international law and of the United States following international law. But you know, one of the points of international law is that you know, we're all agreeing upon it, so hopefully we're all agreeing on fairly workable rules that are going to make sense. Also, one of the points of international law in our system is that uh, an extremist um, you know, Congress uh, can decide to overrule it uh, in particular instances if, if it's necessary. Um, and also, the, you know, the political branches, primarily the executive, play a big role in um, determining its shape and content, you know, what treaties to sign, you know, how treaties provisions will, will look. Um, and so, uh, you know, in, in general, international law is a much better fit for a uh, restraint on the United States government when it's operating extraterritorially. Uh, so I'm going to stop there because we're out of time. Um, unfortunately, I'm, or fortunately, depending on whether you agree with me or not, uh, I'm not going to give examples of what I think is this convergence. Maybe we can talk about it later. But I really do think that, again, while you know, David's certainly right that there are, um, you know, really stark instances of growing distinctions based on citizenship, I, I think the larger trends are, are really in the opposite direction where rights of citizens and non-citizens are, are, are coming a lot closer together. And to some extent, but, you know, that has occurred by, by reducing the rights of U.S. citizens. Um, but I think convergence is, is, is the bigger picture and the more long-term trend. Uh, thank you, Andrew. Now we'll hear from Jennifer Elsie. Uh, good morning. Uh, I first have to issue the standard disclaimer uh, for my employer. <laughs> Anything that I say does not reflect the position of the Congressional Research Service, which those of you familiar with the Congressional Research 
person out that doesn't take a position on anything. You decide to take a position on something, it still won't be theirs. <laughs> I'm going to frame our discussion around the meaning and importance of citizenship for purposes of traditional international law. In that backdrop, I will explore the application of the right of due process for citizens and aliens within the United States and abroad. Historically, citizenship has been thought of as a relationship of an individual to a sovereign uh, government encompassing the obligations of the <coughs> The citizen enjoyed the protection of the government and its laws in return for his allegiance and obedience to those laws. The intertwined concepts of allegiance and protection, however, were not limited to citizens. There was also a territorial element to it, stemming from the fact that it's, uh, that uh, each state generally has exclusive authority to regulate conduct in its own territory. Aliens on the territory of a host state owe local allegiance to the sovereign in return for temporary protection of the laws of the land. If a state on whose territory the alien resided denied that alien equal protection under its laws, they would be in breach of its obligations to the, the, the national home state. Of course, there was never any requirement that aliens enjoy all of the privileges of citizenship such as the right to participate in government. It has been established in the United States since the earliest days of the Republic that aliens on its territory enjoy the full protection of the laws. There was considerable discussion on this topic during the debates over the Alien Constitution Acts. The Alien Act subjected alien friends on U.S. territory to summary of deportation in the event the president were to determine they were a danger to public safety. It was very controversial because opponents felt that aliens in the United States are subject to ordinary laws and should be tried in court rather than summarily deported. Proponents argued that aliens within the United States owed merely temporary allegiance to the United States and were therefore not entitled to the same rights as citizens and all governments have to have all the right to deport aliens who pose danger. The view that aliens on U.S. territory have a temporary allegiance to the United States um, but pretty much equal protection under the law seems to prevail. It is well settled that persons under the Fifth Amendment include citizens and aliens within the United States. While courts have sometimes suggested that only aliens with lawful permanent residence in the United States are entitled to due process protection, the Supreme Court has, in fact, held that it says all aliens, even those whose presence is unlawful, involuntary, or transitory. The level of process that is due varies according to the substantive right being asserted, however, and such rights may vary according to the, uh, immigration status. The greatest historical distinction in terms of due process among citizens and classes of aliens, which is what Adam was talking about, is wartime. In the, in the, the Alien Enemy Act, uh, which was also part of the Alien Sufficient Act, did not did not provoke any disagreement at all in Congress. No one worried about the treatment of any aliens, even though they could be interned or have their property uh, confiscated on a summary basis. Allegiance to the home country, for that matter, was simply presumed, and therefore, such detention or confiscation served the wartime uh, purpose of disabling the enemy. It is also arguable that a state of war and hostilities takes place in the United States eliminates due process rights of any enemy fighter altogether, at least in areas of active hostilities. War also affects the obligations of citizens and inhabitants. Uh, belligerents have traditionally imposed on those under their jurisdiction an obligation to refrain from trade with the enemy, any country and persons, no matter how benign a particular transaction may seem. Transactions intended to assist the enemy could expose those owing allegiance to be charged with aiding the enemy or in treason. Like the belligerent right of internment of enemy persons and confiscation of property, the prohibition of commerce is aimed at depriving the enemy of resources favorable to conduct of war. It was once thought that the Constitution stops at the water's edge, at least the parts that set forth the rights of the government. However, that strictly territorial understanding is not the static to make it the evolving. Broadly speaking, two schools of thought have emerged on the matter of the extraterritorial application of the Constitution. Under one view, it describes that the United States as a limited government, which derives its existence and all of its powers from the Constitution. The Constitution follows the flag. Whenever or wherever those powers are exercised, they are subject to all the limitations contained in the Constitution. A second school of thought regards the Constitution as a social contract between the government, the government and the government 
but do not extend beyond the provisions of the Supreme Court. Until the 1950s, the Constitution was not considered to cover citizens abroad. American citizens could be tried overseas by consular or extraterritorial court, uh, or in areas subject to military occupation by military tribunal, without the ordinary constitutional provisions regarding criminal trials. In Reed v. Colbert, the court rejected the idea that when the United States acts against citizens abroad, it can do so free of the Bill of Rights. The United States is entirely a creature of the Constitution, as the court said. Its power and authority have no other source. It can only act in accordance with all the limitations imposed by the Constitution. When the government reaches out to punish a citizen who is abroad, the Constitution's protection of the government should not be stripped away just because he happens to be in another land. Supreme Court statements to the effect that aliens gain constitutional rights upon entry into the country and formation of links to the community might be read from the aliens abroad uh, have no constitutional protections. Yet the Supreme Court has yet to really decide this case. In at least one sense, foreign nationals with no connection to the United States are accompanied by due process. Uh, they cannot be subject to lawsuits in, st in a state in which they have not formed minimum contacts by purposely uh, directly acting toward it. It has never been held that aliens brought involuntarily to the United States for criminal trial may be denied due process of law due to their lack of positive connections with the United States. In Johnson v. Eisenhower, the World War II case, the Supreme Court addressed whether alien enemies captured abroad and held in the U.S. occupied territory overseas could challenge their convictions by military officials. The court said no, holding that. The Constitution does not confer a right of personal security or an immunity for military trial and punishment upon an alien who may be engaged in the hostile services of government at uh, uh, war with the United States. Still, the Supreme Court's opinion in Reed and Colbert, just a decade later, seemed to reject the strictly territorial understanding of the extension of the Constitution, the one in which the executive branch officials operate under constitutional restraints even when operating overseas. Justices were careful in that case to limit it to the citizens, but they did not explain why it should be different uh, in the case of aliens. In the 1990 case of Verdugo uh, Torquides, the Supreme Court addressed Fourth Amendment rights of aliens abroad. In the course of determining that such rights do not apply to aliens without significant ties to the United States, the majority distinguished between Fourth Amendment rights, which apply to the people, and other amendments like the Fifth Amendment that apply to persons. Chief Justice Rehnquist applied a social contract theory to reason that the people refers to a class of persons who are part of the national community or who have otherwise developed sufficient connection with this country to be considered to be part of that community. At the same time, the majority suggested the Fifth Amendment rights do not apply to aliens abroad. Then in 2008, the case from Bush, the Supreme Court ruled that habeas corpus extends to detainees at Guantanamo Bay. In so holding, the court stated that the Constitution's extraterritorial application turns on objective fact factors and practical concerns. The court rejected the government's formalist interpretation, which depended solely on the sovereign nature of the territory of Guantanamo. Although the court did not clarify which constitutional rights, other than the privilege of habeas corpus, would extend to the detainees, the opinion suggests that at least some aliens detained abroad have some due process rights. Otherwise, they would seemingly have no right to this ad determination in the first place. Lower courts have interpreted the above cases to apply constitutional due process rights to aliens abroad only to the extent that they have formed sufficient ties with the United States. The D.C. Circuit has maintained that the Fifth Amendment does not apply to aliens or foreign entities without presence or a property in the United States unless the alien is or entity is forced to defend itself uh, in U.S. court. <coughs> but this one appellate court has suggested that Boumediene may apply a functional approach to all cases in which an alien asserts an extraterritorial constitutional violation, including under the due process clause, while others have limited the case to the suspension clause of the Federal Corpus. At first, the extension of criminal jurisdiction overseas was largely limited to the conduct of citizens abroad under the nationality principle of international law, uh, which was never constitutionally endowed. Increasingly, however, jurisdiction over conduct overseas has found additional support to the principles of passive personality and protection 
when the victim is a national of the United States or crimes that is committed against the United States. The most often invoked constitutional ground for determining the validity of an exercise of jurisdiction is said to be the due process clause. A number of the a very small number of defendants have succeeded in having their cases dismissed based on the case or because Congress presumes that the Army Exit Doctrine uh, to intend statutes to comply with international law. On the other hand, where Congress has explicitly provided the criminal statutes to apply to the territorial, the courts don't generally look to look and see whether it's in compliance with international law. Some of the circuit courts have developed varying tests for determining when an exercise of extraterritorial jurisdiction over an alien uh, violates due process. Some require a nexus between the United States and the circumstances of the offense, without which a prosecution may be deemed arbitrary or unfair. No such nexus requirement need be met, however, if the offenders were arrested on a stateless vessel on the high seas, or uh, because those sailing on the ships forfeited protections under international law. The nexus requirement is also vitiated when the United States is obligated by treaty to prosecute certain crimes. Uh, the nexus test is said to perform the same function with the minimum context uh, test serves in civil, civil litigation to determine whether a defendant should reasonably anticipate being hailed into court. Other circuits have rejected the nexus requirement and analyzed jurisdiction based solely on whether on fundamental fairness. Some courts have determined this fundamental fairness by inquiring whether an exercise of uh, extraterritorial jurisdiction comports with international law systems. Others apparently find this positive, the possibility that a prosecution might impinge on the interests of the nation. As the courts inevitably confront more defendants from overseas, caught in the web of anti-terrorism laws, it can be expected that challenges to jurisdiction on this basis will increase. The Supreme Court has yet to review the doctrinal paradox that the due process clause is claimed to provide most protection to aliens who are provided the least coverage. Perhaps the time is right for the Supreme Court to reassess its approach in this regard. The court has recently reinvigorated its commitment toward the presumption against extraterritoriality of the statutes, but it has also relied on a more pragmatic approach to determining how the Constitution applies abroad. A return to historical considerations based on concepts of international law might serve to satisfy both the formalist and functional side of the debate. This approach would reconnect the lost link between allegiance and protection. Extraterritorial jurisdiction over an alien would be presumed reasonable in the case of conduct which breaches an obligation on the part of the alien or his state of nationality. Such an obligation could arise from a treaty or from the general obligation to refrain from injuring um, another sovereign or its nationals. It would seem that most of the cases in which a sufficient nexus has been found to, uh, to be, would be established under the current approach in some circuits would also satisfy this requirement. Crimes that are subject to universal jurisdiction would continue to uh, apply universally. On the other hand, if the statute in question is more akin to a prohibition on trading with the enemy, uh, for, in other words, where the, where the government mobilizes its own people to support its foreign policy objectives, then uh, foreigners outside the United States would not be expected to pitch in. Under this view, sanctions laws might apply only to those within the United States, <laughs> and to those abroad who purposefully avail themselves of U.S. markets. This would sharpen the distinction between the targets of provisions like the prohibition on internal support of terrorism and those obliged to assist the United States in carrying it out. Thank you very much. Uh, now let's turn things over to uh, Neil. Um, so I'd like to thank the faculty and student uh, organizers of the conference for having me today to, to discuss some of these very interesting I'm sorry, closer? Oh, okay, sorry. Um, yes, I'd like to thank the students and faculty organizers for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. So in my remarks today, I'd like to consider a theoretical question that underlies a lot of the cosmopolitan views of rights and citizenship that are being expressed by some of the participants at this conference. 
what I want to what I want to focus on is the abstraction of human dignity and personhood that's at the core of this view, and explain perhaps how some of these abstractions fail to engage a fundamental problem about how to actually secure rights. So I'll begin by talking about what I consider to be a deep rights cosmopolitanism, a cosmopolitanism that locates rights in people by virtue of their personhood, um, rather than through their connection to a state. And I will consider why this way about thinking about rights doesn't necessarily follow from the liberal tradition or even our constitutional tradition, in part because it confuses recognition of certain abstract human rights with the protection of those rights. And finally, I will conclude with some thoughts about the responsibility to protect and how this cosmopolitan view of rights is sort of embodied in that doctrine. So, so I think if people have addressed this question, you know, why should uh, citizens or people within the United States be treated the same as people who are abroad and the aliens abroad? And, and it seems to me that scholars who take a broad view of the extension of rights depending on a particular abstraction an abstraction that elevates the importance of a certain basic human dignity, which is to say the dignity that people enjoy simply by virtue of their humanness. And from this dignity, it's argued, flows certain human rights, um, and human rights that should be protected by governments, including, of course, the US government. Um, David Cole spoke about this um, this morning in this morning's panel, and, and I just wanted to, to quote from one of his books where he, I think, captures this view very well. He says, these rights are best understood not as special privileges stemming from a specific social contract, but as inherent in what it means to be a free person with human dignity. They are human rights, not privileges of citizenship, and ought to apply whenever the government seeks to impose legal obligations on persons. I think it's sort of the paradigmatic idea behind a lot of these views that he captures so well. And it's argued that from this inherent human dignity, the U.S. government has to protect certain basic rights of virtually everyone, or if not quite everyone, then almost anyone who's affected by the actions of the U.S. government, or some people have said even the non-actions of the U.S. government. Um, and so and the extension of this rights protection isn't decided as a political matter you know, within our polity or a moral matter as a discussion amongst people in our society, but rather often through judicial review um, against claims, you know, claims brought in claims against the government. And of course, I have to say the cosmopolitan formulation has a tremendous amount of appeal, right? I mean, our basic idea is that we have certain inalienable rights um, simply by virtue of our humanity. But of course, even accepting that sort of dignity that we have, even accepting the inalienable rights that we may possess, it still leaves a very important question about what type of obligation those rights imposed on any states. So in the cosmopolitan view, rights depend not on the form of government, um, not on consent or contract, but really instead on humanity itself. And these rights are thought to exist independent of the state or as being liberated from the state because rights, and not just rights, but the protection of those rights depend on this basic human dignity we have. And of course, if that was the if that was the foundation for rights, then territorial or citizenship or other types of limits would have far less importance. So that brings me to my second point, which is that this understanding of rights as flowing from our humanness may be very attractive as an abstraction, but it really doesn't answer the very hard question about rights, which is how to, how to provide for them, how to secure them. Um, to say that we're all equal is one thing, but of course to treat people as equal, to provide for them equality, requires a lot more. And so I think the abstract respect for rights, or the recognition of rights, doesn't get us very far. Um, rather, the thing that was really the innovation in our Constitution was that rights were secured by the government, and of course here I can't improve on the Declaration, which recognized inalienable rights, but then goes on to say to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. So what the abstract fact of our humanness doesn't provide is a way for securing rights. We emphatically need to have something more. And I think this is true not just as a practical matter, um, which of course many people recognize, but I think it's also true as a theoretical matter 
or foundational matter. The creation of the state, in many ways, was a precondition for even thinking about rights and equality. So, for instance, the Stoics, um, who are often cited for their commitment to cosmopolitan ideals, they developed their ideas about individual human worth in a particular polity, a polity in which human dignity stemmed from the fact of civic engagement and citizenship. And it was this dignity of the citizen that they were so aware of, that they were so familiar with, that allowed them to extrapolate to the rights and dignity of people everywhere. I think similarly during the Enlightenment, when thinkers elevated the view of the individual and individual rights, they also defended a robust view of the nation state. The universal rights of man were part of a world in which citizenship was linked with the fulfillment of individual lives. And organization through the state allowed people not to have just an abstract concept of right, but to really have protection for those rights and equality as members of the state. Um, Richard Tuck has a very interesting book about this, where he provides a careful reading of many liberal thinkers, tracing the importance of the association between the concept of the state and the robust concept of autonomous rights bearing individuals. And I think it's fair to say that the classical liberal theorists were understood that rights accounted for very little in the state of nature. You know, rights came from political association, such association requires certain mutual recognition of rights of others in providing for the general welfare and for providing external security for that welfare against others. Of course, in the 20th century, Hannah Arendt raised a number of these themes connecting the development of human equality with political organization. And she said, Equality, in contrast to all that is involved in mere existence, is not given us, but is the result of human organization insofar as it is guided by the principle of justice. We are not born equal, we become equal as members of a group on the strength of our decision to guarantee ourselves mutually equal rights. Aaron's point, ultimately, is that universal rights based on human dignity are simply happy platitudes without the security of the state. And so I think looking at political theory and looking at our history, the concept and the origin of individual dignity and the means for protecting rights follow from the idea that that dignity and those rights exist within a state. And our very concept of enforceable individual rights is tied to our understanding of the states. And so, um, but I think it's also the case that the security that we provide for our rights, for instance, in the United States, allows us to contemplate what sorts of protections are appropriate to give to people outside of our community, however that's defined. Um, and Americans often take very seriously what rights should be or what protections should be granted to people outside the scope of our immediate polity. But it seems that the scope of those rights is emphatically a political question, um, perhaps a moral question, you know, an important moral question, but not really a question of, of rights in the sense in which we're used to thinking about them. And I think it's a political question because it's not just a trade-off between our security, you know, in the context of enemy aliens and the liberty of others, but rather the fact that our security, of course, is inextricably linked to the, to the protection of our liberty. So far, I just wanted to talk a little bit about responsibility to protect, or R2P. Um, you say, what does R2P have to, to do with this idea? Um, and I think R2P depends very much on a similar type of logic and abstraction of locating rights in individuals and asserting obligations on states, you know, short of any actual association between people and states. And so as I'm sure most of you are familiar, R2P is this idea that states should be responsible for the safety and security of people. The foremost states have to protect their own people, but when they fail to do so, of course, other states should possibly step in to help. And, um, and I think that, that the failure of R2P, the question about whether it does exist or even can exist, suggests some of the practical and theoretical difficulties of a view that separates individual rights from states. And of course, again, I have to say R2P certainly has a kind of appeal because it's the case that states often fail to protect the safety of their citizens or their people, and Syria is only one of the more recent and notable examples about this. Um, 
And you think what's happening in Syria might be a core application of the circumstances in which RGP would apply. You know, like that 100,000 people have been killed, some, you know, 1,500 people may have been killed through chemical weapons and more. And so it seems, you know, what good does it do to posit the abstract rights um, of the Syrians? Right? Maybe it shows some compassion we have for them. But obviously, it doesn't stop the killing. You know, what good does it do to say that they have some rights to safety when those rights are not enforceable? I mean, in the context of RGP, you can see very clearly the gap between abstract rights and protected rights. And it's not just a practical problem of getting states to intervene and help out, but I think it shows up the theoretical incoherence. Protection of rights and dignity comes through the association of others and within a particular state. You know, one of the reasons that's often that's talked about in not intervening in Syria, and of course there are many, is that we're not sure what precisely to do, what precisely to do to make things better. Um, how do you intervene to restore order in a country that's wracked by civil war and is fractured with so many different um, fighting entities? Um, and the proponents of RTP often try to move away from rights talk. They try to say, this isn't about the rights of people, it's really about the obligations that states have to people. But of course, to say the state has an obligation to someone is <laughs> on having some view that they have certain rights, even if it's just to a minimal amount of security. Um, but those rights, I mean, what, are those, what are those rights really worth, I guess? Um, you know, what other states have is not really a responsibility, but they always have is what they've had before, which is an option to help. And whatever intervention occurs, whatever help is provided, is ultimately going to be decided by domestic politics, by international politics, um, but not on the basis that the Syrians have any rights that we're obliged to help. So I guess in sum, I would just say that the abstraction of rights located in persons, of course, is an attempt to expand rights protection, and that's a, a laudable goal. But I think ultimately that abstract rights fail to provide any actual security for rights without something more. Thank you, uh, Linda. Thanks to all the panelists uh, for staying well within time. Um, and one other thank you, which I neglected to make at first, which was uh, to the law review. Um, uh, Alex Wolf and his team, and indeed these uh, papers will be uh, published by the Court of Law Review. Um, let me insert the prerogative of the chair, and I've got a uh, 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 normative hypo and a historical point. I think they're primarily for Naomi and Andrew, but uh, it's jump ball if anybody wants them. So here's the normative uh, uh, hypo which is, imagine two different worlds. One world in which we have 195 nations in which they absolutely, in which each one has a domestic constitution that absolutely prohibits torture domestically, but absolutely permits it extraterritorially. Versus a world in which we have 195 nations that absolutely prohibit torture domestically and also absolutely prohibit it extraterritorially, or even qualifiably permit it uh, extraterritorially. Why is not that second world a more attractive normative world? It seems to me that that would more greatly facilitate peace and commerce and some of these other benefits that the you enter in particular denominate. And that it would at least prevent uh, uh, the violations of the right against torture to the extent they occur. Um, those violations seem to be more important whether they're episodic or not. So, uh, and, and in fact, it just my remarks to, I guess, both of you is, Nothing in your, or little in your uh, uh, first principles or presumptions seems to justify drawing the line where you do, right? So that's my, I think, primarily the you entered. So to Naomi, I think my reaction to your remarks is, sure, granted, nation states, sovereign nation states are important for, the, uh, for realizing um, the idea of fundamental rights. But that's not really the question that we're in Lewis Hagen, among others, who's no fan of sovereignty, you know, conceived of that. But that's not really the question. The question is, should those nation states have a guaranteed rights on the basis of territory citizenship uh, or both, be then permitted without constraints to um, likely violate those rights with impunity outside of citizenship boundaries or outside of um, territory? 
Um, and it seems to me that at least one account of the founding is more consistent with a notion of constraints. In other words, that yes, uh, there are these abstract rights out there, and I think you know that is one sort of the century enlightenment. And indeed, the other story is governments are instituted among men and women to realize those rights. But that um, uh, you know, again, nothing about that account nest requires the conclusion that the government instituted to uh, protect rights, which I think you know is the dominant federalist understanding of the Constitution. It's not a social compact government theory. So it's a it's a popular <coughs> sovereignty theory, which is we the people create this limited <coughs> government with constraints on it. It seems to me there's nothing in that theory or nothing about anything that you say that requires the conclusion that those constraints have to stop at the border or that they have to stop uh, with regard to citizenship. So that's why I, 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 I guess I'm seeking um, uh, a justification for stopping where both of you do. Uh, so I'm not a big reporter. Uh, but, you know, I've learned a lot of stuff in our law. The question that for me is sort of who decides on, on what basis. I mean, in your hypothetical, uh, we have a provision that's, uh, you know, that's inserted into your constitution and all these countries by whatever means people have chosen uh, to put things in their constitution. The way that we initially chose to put things in our constitution is to have people get together and think about it and debate it and write it and then decide whether we wanted it. Um, but if, you know, what I've you know, for the most part, what we're talking about, it, uh, what I'm talking about, it, is a situation not where there's a very clear right that has been through formal processes, you know, adopted in our constitution, but we're talking about you know, judicial construction for the most part. And so, if torture can be prohibited by our constitution, then it is. Uh, it's through the substantive process clause. Um, and uh, you know, in general, my preference for uh, you know, who determines extraterritorial constraints and how the government is operating in you know, military or security or intelligence profession is not through judicial construction, but it's through uh, a decision that's you know, debated in Congress with the input from the executive branch. Uh, and that's how treaties are made, that's how statutes are made. I mean, you know, we can't statute, that's, that's terrific. It's a great, that's a great statute. I, I, I support it, it's the goal of this method, but to your point, in particular, I support that that's how we should decide uh, you know, what limits we want to put on our military operating territory. So it's just primarily a question of, uh, of institutional legitimacy capacity. I think my answer is similar to Andrew's in that um, it's not so much that I think that at the border, you know, all rights stop. I think it's a question of how do we determine what rights protections apply out of the community, whether it's a community of citizenship or territory of boundary or some sort of association. And I think that that question is really a political question, right, to the in Congress. And even if you think of the state as an act of popular sovereignty, not necessarily a contract, that popular sovereignty view, I think, is consistent with dealing with questions of security outside the state. It's a political matter and not necessarily a matter of judicial review. So, so state people have rights, you know, outside in the same way they do inside, however you want to define inside and outside. I think um, these problematics, I think, are different circumstances for figuring what those protections are. Not that we shouldn't have those protections, but we have a different mechanism for thinking about them and figuring out how they should be applied. So I, my question might be the same as Marty's question, but I'm in particular. And I took you to be saying that um, there's a some kind of theoretical problem with articulating conceptions of rights uh, without an enforcement mechanism. And that the necessary relationship between rights and the enforcement rights has some consequence for whether rights should be extended to one group of people or another group of people. And I guess I, I'm not, I guess I don't follow that because it seems to me we have an we have an enforcement mechanism. We have a court that enforces rights. And the question is, what are the rights that it should be enforcing? And should it? In what circumstances should it be enforcing rights as? apply to all people and in, what, in all locations and what circumstances should be limited to um, people here or to citizens. And I, so there's an enforcement mechanism that doesn't answer in any way the question of how far the rights should go. The same thing is true with the European Convention on Human Rights. There's a 
There's an enforcement mechanism. It's, there's an international enforcement mechanism. In the UK, there's also a domestic enforcement mechanism. But that doesn't really answer the question. Um, so I don't, it doesn't seem to me that, um, that this, the, the, the link you're making really gets us an answer to how far we should extend number one. And then number two, I also think that there are rights that are not enforceable. The McCain Amendment is a, is a perfect example. The McCain Amendment said that all people, wherever they are, have a right not to be subjected to cruel and mean treatment, but provided no enforcement mechanism. There is no enforcement mechanism. But the notion was that the articulation of that right, nonetheless, we, we, we can't sue somebody for it, we can't hold somebody criminally accountable for it, but it's a right. And the right, even without enforcement, assumption is that he's not doing something meaningless, he's doing something that will reduce the uh, incidence of this kind of uh, violation. So I just don't see how, and well, I, I see it be, it's always useful to have enforceable rights, I like enforceable rights, but I don't think it determines the concept of the right, nor is it necessary um, to, 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 to the uh, articulation of the right. I guess, um, I guess we think that the, the very concept of a, of a real right, you know, a right is a trump or a claim against the government it has to have some kind of enforcement mechanism. And the fact that Article Three courts exist for the claims of, say, enemy aliens, I don't think necessarily means that they have rights in that same Right, exactly. Right. That's my point. That's my point. And so, so it, it doesn't, it, it sounded to me like you were saying that enforcement <coughs> is, that the, the concept of enforcement is somehow defines the boundaries of where rights should be. And I don't think it does at all. I guess I don't think it's just enforcement, but I think it's some sort of association between a person and a state. Not necessarily citizenship, not necessarily territory, or those, all those are sometimes good places to draw the line. Um, so I think it has to, the idea that someone can have a claim against the government depends on having some sort of associational link and not just an abstract, Right, in some sense. And that's not just about enforcement, but I think it's also about association. Thanks. Uh, I want to reverse the analysis, if I may, and particularly in light of, um, I guess, the last comment about uh, the associational nature being a basis for making a claim against the government. but. It's really asymmetrical as it currently stands, which is the government has claims against people with no association. So to what extent does the question of citizenship or association limit the government's ability? So right now we have the United States, among others, prosecuting people who've never been to the United States, never committed conduct in the United States, and for the most part, committing conduct that has no direct impact on the United States other than in an abstract political way. And yet the United States hails them from various parts of the world and brings them here for prosecution. And so are there, shouldn't there be limits on the government's ability? If we're going to limit what a person can claim from the U.S. government, uh, shouldn't we do the, the following? And, and in addition, the sub uh, part of that, uh, David is correct about procedural protections in the courts, in the federal courts, for uh, aliens. It's not true substantive. So for example, even if you're a United States citizen, if you're searched by the Kenyan police, you don't have a Fourth Amendment protection, even if the United States participates in it. There's a very, very strong standard of joint venture and all that. So I want to see if, if, if there's a sense of, of symmetry. That's not what I have on the plate. We've got that to everyone. Everyone. Yeah. Uh, I'm happy. I'll just say I agree. Thank you for your largely agree, but I think that's also more or less what our current law requires. Um, not in every single particular, but certainly anybody who's going to, you know, who's brought back to the United States, uh, you know, the most extreme form of, you know, assertion of authority over them uh, in a you know, criminal case, they're going to have you know, every right of protection. There are, you know, there are some hard lines, right, questions like, you know, whether Miranda required extraterritorially and all these things, when is the search warrant required? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think the, the law is moving towards thinking that, you know, anyone who's going to be subject to Article III courts you know, should probably have something that looks very, very similar to the kinds of rights they would have when they're in the United States, but, you know, there are some practical issues. Um, 
but, I, mean, I guess my response is I, I think I think the law is heading in, in the direction where you want it. So well, I think I, I'm looking at Karen to make sure that yeah, uh, I think that's it for this panel. So we can get to uh, lunch on time and have uh, continue the discussion. Uh,